cool. Strapping on Docker, which is a uh, <coughs> set of tools related to virtualization and containers. Is that right? Containers. And uh, do you want to talk about what the, the talk you lined up next month? Yeah, I will. Okay. Um, so, so next month we got Chet Ramey to come in, and he's going to talk about the history of Bash. So I don't know how many of you know. I didn't know this until Steve told me actually. Oh, he's but the Chet, author. <laughs> yeah, he's the author of Bash. So he's from Northeast Ohio. At least he lived, lived here for Case. a long time. Oh, yeah. And uh, yeah, Case and uh, we, you know, we reached out to him a couple of times, and we ended up getting him to come in. So he's going to come in next month. I think it's June fifth. Yeah. Whatever the first Thursday of June. Talk about the Bash show. Yep. Yeah, so talking about the history of writing it and how you know managing an open source project for 20 years. So, so it was pretty. It's pretty interesting. I, I mean, I, I just don't. Oh, yeah, I got it. It'll blow Patrick and I out of the water. We talked too much. I'll take the risk. They're my students. Yeah. You guys get to see my my fierce organization. So, how many of you guys have used Docker? No, how many of you know what Docker is? Like, in, okay. And then how many of you have heard of it? Okay, so more have heard of it. On Meetup, I started out. Okay. So it's, so literally, it sounds crazy. I'll give you the background. Four months ago, I didn't care about Linux containers. I just didn't care. There was just wasn't a use case that made me care about it. And um, most of the time we virtualize everything. Most of the people I know, most of the customers I work with, they all virtualize everything. And it just didn't seem like a compelling, you know, a compelling use case. So I just didn't care. And then literally this company called Dot Cloud had uh, this little side project. They were trying to compete with like Rackspace and, and DreamHost and all these other guys trying to host something. They're having a hosting company. And they kind of come up with this cool way of wrapping Linux containers, LXC. And, uh, it, it was kind of novel, it, it, you know, and, and it just took off, basically. And so within the last four months, literally Red Hat's been working with this company called Docker Inc. that is a spin-off of Dot Cloud. And uh, they ended up taking Dot Cloud, or Docker Inc. ended up taking, I forget, 10, 17, something, somewhere between 10, 15 million dollars in investment and just taken off. And then if you look at Red Hat Enterprise Linux 7, so Fedora 19, 20, basically, you know, Fedora 18, 19, 20, it, we've, we've integrated with Docker like more rapidly than I've ever seen. You know, usually when an operating system is on the cusp of coming out, you know, right before you're kind of releasing the next version, you don't make major changes, like change the way the containers are done. But but that is what happened here in like the last four or five months. And so it's just been really cool. And so it's kind of like OpenStack. It's a buzzword right now. I mean, if you if you just Google Docker, I mean, there's tons of news articles and LinkedIn and everything else talking about Docker. And uh, so that's why I got excited about it. And actually, once I saw it in action, so I ended up kind of becoming the the, the doctor expert among a lot of the technical people at Red Hat, at least from a non-engineering perspective. So we have a bunch of engineers that are working on a ton of them. Like literally, we, we had Red Hat Summit two weeks ago, and uh, the doctor guys came out, and like I think all the whole team was there. It was like seven of them. And some of these guys hadn't even met each other. You know, some were like remote workers. So so uh, we have one guy dedicated at Red Hat that almost like basically lives on the doctor team, even though it's a separate company. And so you know, how open source is odd. So you've got kind of different bedmates and. Uh, and uh, he's, his job is to kind of make it work in RHEL 6 and 7 and possibly even 5 and maybe, maybe even 4. So uh, that, that, that I was told I should not talk about, but uh, I don't want to do that. But, uh, recorded. Drink more beer. Yeah, no. So, uh, yeah. so, uh, so it, it's interesting, and I'll, I'll dig into why. So, oh, by the way, my title changed. I'm not a senior cloud infrastructure architect, but I'm a solution architect. So, so I kind of covered it. So what is Docker? So Docker is three main things, and I just keep this high level, and I'll dig in deeper. So it's a set of user space tools that currently do not, they reside in Fedora, they reside in Ubuntu, they reside in a lot of Linux distributions, especially the, the rapid paced you know, Linux distributions like Ubuntu and Fedora and, and Mint. And what, what's uh, the, the latest one I heard that was like totally taken off at the speed of light? It's called like uh, 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 element, element elementary or elementary? Element, elementary. Yeah, what, I, what is that about? Like, it's literally went from like zero yeah. to like a million users in like, I don't know, not very long, like is a year. One by Sony? It's, it's a Debian based it's one. Yeah. It's another Debian based yeah, it's one. Yeah, it's I, I think people, Ubuntu made people with Unity and made people mad or something. I don't know. Who knows? But uh, but it's in like all of these distributions, yeah, all the cross based ones. <laughs> so, 
So to set user space tools in RHEL, Red Hat Enterprise Linux, you have to use the EPL, so extra package for Enterprise Linux. That's what I go through, so I'll talk about CentOS and RHEL. Um, I don't know if you guys, another thing, probably a backing PC you might not know. So CentOS, does everyone know about CentOS and Red Hat? Yeah, correct. Okay, so everyone's heard that one. That one's a pretty famous one. So for the, those that may have not heard, Red Hat acquired uh, CentOS essentially, <coughs> I guess for lack of a better word, because they're an open source project, they're not really a company. But uh, we hired, uh, probably like five out of seven or th four out of seven of the main contributors and then added a bunch of people and then made a public board. So it will, it will be a true open source project in that it will be like Apache and everything else where there are these board of directors that's very public and very transparent about how they operate. So, so long story short, I'll talk more about CentOS without, uh, before if you talk to Red Hat people, they wouldn't always you know, use CentOS in demos and things, but so now, now we'll. <laughs> as long as you mentioned it, what is the future of CentOS? The future of CentOS is what they get out of it, which is basically what everyone asks, is they become a more full-fledged distribution. So like Ubuntu is a pretty full-fledged distribution, even though it's based off Debian. And CentOS had historically just been an enterprise Linux rebuild. They had tried to keep it as the, the most similar as they could, you know, the same as they could. And um, what happens is now they create these special interest groups. So one of the most interesting things I've seen happen early on already, very like the first couple weeks, was they had uh, in, in uh, maybe a week before FOSDEM, which is that giant you know, open source conference, it's the biggest one in the world out in Brussels. I think a week before that they had worked, you know, they were at another conference or some little local conference that they had built uh, CentOS images for Eucalyptus, for CloudStack, for all these other, like there's a, there's a ton of competing like cloud management platforms, if you will, that are similar to OpenStack. Are you guys familiar with OpenStack? But a lot of these are not backed by Red Hat, so it's kind of an open, wide open west. The Eucalyptus was actually the first. They actually mimic Amazon's AWS API, and so it's a, it's a piece of software that you deploy on site at your business, and it, 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 it has the exact same API. You can even use the Amazon tools to connect to it and manage it. So they were the first. They've been around for, I don't know, at least six years, I would think. And, uh, but, but the thing was is CentOS didn't work really very close with them. So, and, but still everybody kind of wants to use the Enterprise Linux because the way Red Hat builds it, it's pretty good, even in its form where you rebuild it. So, so basically now CentOS kind of become their own like distribution where they'll support all these different you know, cloud platforms. You'll never see if that stuff really run on RHEL as like its base. You know, it's not something that would, gets delivered by us anyway. It would be like an ISV relationship where they would maybe sell it and run it on there. So you're seeing them, they have a cloud special interest group that's able to do all these sort of special things where they build these images, you know, and, and these are like pre-built, you know, like an AMI, you guys all familiar with an AMI for Amazon. There's special formats for each virtualization software. So for like, for like Amazon, there's an AMI for VMware, there's VMDKs for Rev, there's, you know, QCOW2 and raw files. And so, so now CentOS is building all these, I don't want to call them proprietary, but they're different formats for all these different pieces of software. So they're building all these different ones ahead of time. So they have like a cloud special interest group. They have uh, a science special interest group that may, it sounds like, still in the process of being negotiated. Nobody's really totally come out publicly, but Scientific Linux might just become a special interest group within CentOS. It's either going to be that or a rebuild of CentOS is what it sounds like. So, so those are the kinds of things that happen. So CentOS is becoming now the upstream or partner for other you know, enterprise Linux rebuilds. And then there is a special interest group called CentOS that is the goal is to stay as close to Red Hat as we can. So there's still that. So that won't go away per se. But uh, we always tell people if you want that to stay, then contribute to that community because now that's a completely community project. You know, so you can join the board on it, work on it. And, you know, it's not. It's kind of when it was a CentOS guys, there was a lot of them. nobody was sure of what the rules were exactly because like some of these relationships had never really been formed before. Like nobody had ever had a giant open source company that then had somebody else was rebuilding their software. Like that never happened with SUSE. Never happened with a lot of the other distributions. So. There's, I don't want to call it tension, but there's misunderstanding, and now there's no misunderstanding about what it is, and the lawyers are all on the same page, and everybody knows exactly what it is. So I would say participate in that, in that, uh, in that community. So long story short, is you'll see me use the EPL, which is extra packages for Enterprise Linux. It's ran very similar to like the Fedora project, but it's a set, it's a repository that you connect to Red Hat Enterprise Linux or CentOS. And uh, those user space tools are not in Red Hat Enterprise Linux yet, but I mean you can obviously play out with all this with CentOS, and I've built all these demos with CentOS. Um, and then LXC, so Linux containers, is a specific type. So there's a million different types of containers that were running in Linux, and everybody had a different idea of how to do it. Um, and in fact, Docker is going to have different drivers to connect to different ways of doing Linux containers. But the way it does it right now is LXC 
Um, and then a branch commit file system is the third piece. So, so that's something that people, this is really, I think, the mind-blowing piece is, is the layered file system. So basically, you spin up a container. You make some changes. That branches. You have this other, like, living, you know, branch of that original base image. You can either throw it away, you know, which would be like a transit workload, which you don't care what happens to it, or you can commit it back as a layer to the, to the original base image. And you can build up these complicated, you know, workflows from that basically, where you would have, you know, like a root image and then have committed, you know, like say I had a root Linux core build and then I have like a web server core build and a database core build and then under that web server core build I might have an Nginx core build and a, you know, and a, an Apache core build, those kinds of things. Are they doing this on top of existing file systems or does this involve a new or modified There's There are like a couple different ways that people are doing it. So the way Ubuntu does it is with AUFS. And so that one is not in the upstream Linux kernel. And from what I understand, the Linux kernel guys don't like it for some reason. I don't know the full details of it, but they, it's not stable. It's one of the original union process. Yeah, and for some reason, they don't like it. So the way Red Hat did it was wrote a driver to device mapper. So it uses thin snapshots. That's the way we do it. Um, there's also another file system that I can't remember what it's called. There's a new file system that's like the up and coming one. The people are saying that's the racehorse that eventually, oh, I know what it is, ButterFS snapshots. Yeah, people want to do it with ButterFS snapshots. I couldn't remember for a second. But uh, yeah, so ButterFS snapshots, people think of that. From what I understand, mind you, all this stuff is consensus because, I mean, this is open source world where everyone votes with, uh, you know, anger and flame wars and, you know, talking about it and you know, whatever. So who knows what will happen. But right now, it's already a good, very good file system. Yeah, it is a pretty decent one. And, uh, and uh, the, 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 but I will say the device mapper way is probably how it will happen in RHEL 7 and how it works in RHEL 6 for sure. So. <coughs> Well, you'll be able to use different drivers, too. So when you specify your directory where you put all your images, I mean, it could be a ButterFS. You could turn on the ButterFS driver and tell it, here's a ButterFS directory. You know, do whatever you want in there. Or you could have it go to a, you know, essentially create lightweight you know, LVM snapshots, point to an LVM, to, you know, to an L LV, basically, or to a BG. So why does it matter? So I had mentioned that I didn't care about Linux containers like four months ago. I just didn't find it interesting. I was like, what is the use case that I could possibly care about? It was kind of the same thing as, as System D. I didn't really see the magic of System D either. But I will tell you how I have now start, started to see the magic of System D and Linux containers combined in one thing. And uh, I'll, I'll dig into actually a little second presentation I have to kind of show that. But I will say it matters because, like, so, for example, I have a RHEL 7 beta image that I use. And I wanted to, like, you know, I run RHEL 6 as the desktop. So if you see this guy, this guy's RHEL 6. And uh, I don't, I don't care. I don't want to run RHEL 7 yet because it's not stable enough. I just want to be able to do work on this laptop. But I need to mess with RHEL 7 because it's coming down the pipe, and I work at Red Hat. I need to know what it is. So, so I run it in a Linux container all the time. So if you run this command, it will literally take sub 200 milliseconds. So it feels as if I'm running a man page on an actual system. So it's pretty cool. I've just now instantly gotten access to other operating systems as if they're like as if they're actually running on my operating system. You can imagine where this goes, too. I could cap the Etsy Red Hat release and then, like, grep for something. So I could find stuff in the file system inside the container in less than 200 milliseconds. I've now just basically branched out and I have access to all these other operating systems that feel like they're touching my finger, which is totally different than running a VM. You know, when you run a VM, you got to spin up the whole thing, far more <coughs> get your core build, do whatever you want. I've got a Docker image that's committed that is the RHEL 7 exactly the way it wants, and I can spin up a million copies of it in 200 milliseconds each. Very different mentality. Like it, I think it's kind of the same thing that happened in the developer space, where, where, where people start using Git and branching and merging, and you're like, oh, this is really fast. I can do this now. Whereas before it was a pain in the butt. So you know, with VMs, I think it was a pain in the butt to to go check things out quickly, and now it's really easy with with Docker. That's one of the main use cases I've found that I love. But I will dig into way more complicated use cases. So you can see, you know, you run man page, bam. I mean, I get, I get access to the system D man page, which system D doesn't get run on RHEL 6. So now I can go far around and understand this and uh, kind of dig in. So, uh, you know, I'll give you some, you know, easier, you know, some simple use cases. You know, see the man page from RHEL 7, RHEL 4, RHEL 5. I get questions all the time because we have customers using all kinds of different versions of RHEL. But I don't want to run RHEL 4. I don't even want to run it in a VM because honestly it takes up a ton of resources in a VM on my laptop. Because if you ever, I don't know if you guys have ever played with the older versions of Linux and, and how far back you guys go, but the older Linux kernels, 
they didn't have a tickless kernel. So like RHEL 6 and above and Ubuntu, maybe, I don't know what version above, they're all pretty quick and they run pretty good as VMs. But some of the older ones don't run that great. Like when I would fire up RHEL 5 VMs on this guy, it would make a high-pitched noise. Like you could tell, it was like, <laughs> 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 like yeah, that's not good. So now running a container, I don't care, right? Because run the newer kernel, so it doesn't matter. And I could fire it up in like 100 milliseconds or 200 milliseconds. So, you know, other things, you know, people will ask you questions. They'll say, hey, hey, you know, how do I do this rsync or whatever? And you're like, ah, oh, crap, I can't remember that. And you know what you usually do? You're just lazy. You're like, oh, I think it's in the man page. Go look it up, whatever. Well, now I can just run the command because I'm actually better at it than they are because I've already done it once. I'll go back, fart around. I'm like, yeah, okay, there's the options. And then cut and paste them into an email, send them to a friend or whatever, or send them to a customer. So, you know, quickly, quickly proving out different versions of software. And I'll dig deeper into that too because you'll see as I show you how the registry server, which I haven't even told you what that is yet, but when you fire up a registry server and how that works, um, you'll see that you actually get every copy of the program with the Docker image. So it's very interesting. Um, you know, test specific versions, scratch pad that I don't want to care about. So again, you know, a lot of times I'll do a yum install for some piece of software on my laptop and then I forget and then like, you know, after for example, I popped this hard drive on my old laptop about two months ago and popped it in this one. So I have like cruft from like five years ago. Well, actually about three years ago on this guy. So, you know, as you start building up that cruft over years, you know, it'd be nice to just do that in a container, not care, not have these RPMs laying all over the place that I don't know what the hell they are. Um, and then, you know, so a simple use case, one of the interesting things is you'll see in RHEL 6, we don't have system D. So we, so you basically, the whole idea of Docker is it runs a single process. And that's hard for people to wrap, wrap their brain around it. It's not a virtual machine. It's a single process that runs within that container. So you can have the entire file system of a different operating system available within that container or within that image. And when you fire it up, it'll run that one process in that context. But it's not made to start multiple processes yet. So the future will be system D will actually run underneath and inside of the container. And then the sky becomes the limit. And, and in RHEL 7, you'll see that our engineer is already working on proving out how to do that with SE Linux and C groups. So it will be very, very well controlled. And uh, in fact, that'll be the foundation of OpenShift, which if you guys know what OpenShift is, it's a platform as a service though, that we host online right now that it actually is using uh, systemd and uh, using Docker containers right now in the hosted version. So it's kind of, a, it's, it's running ahead from the product that we deliver on site to our customers. So, uh, and another thing is, is what I found is, I. What's strange, like the registry server that I downloaded, that's a piece of software that's delivered by Docker, and that's where you like save images to and pull them from. Mm -hmm. I didn't, I fired it up without even caring what OS it ran on, and that's kind of a different feeling that I've ever had because I'm a sysadmin, you know, by heart, you know, at heart, and I was always like, what's in this thing? And I realized when I fired it up, it just worked. It was running on a port, and I just pushed images to it, pulled it from it. I didn't even care what OS was running underneath that. There was some kind of OS embedded in that Linux, you know, in that Docker container, but I just didn't care. That's kind of a different way for a lot of people to think, you know, as long as that kernel lines up well enough and the ABI API compatibility, which you'll get to a scenario where maybe an ecosystem will form and everyone will, it's kind of already happened in the upstream Linux community where like the 2.6.32 kernel is known to be the stable long life kernel. And so, so and I can see, you know, and this is me giving you my gut feeling. I could see an ecosystem forming around that where Ubuntu and SUSE and Red, Red Hat and everybody else kind of agree on certain versions of the kernel and certain ABIs and APIs to say, okay, well, this meets enough of it that we can run containers of your OS and my OS and everybody else all in one place. Now it gets a lot more like virtualization. So, and I will say that RHEL 6, RHEL 7, RHEL 5 will run all on the same, like RHEL 7 should be able to run RHEL 6 and RHEL 5. So we're already thinking about that for our own stuff. But I suspect you may see a community form where everyone agrees on how that, you know, what the kernel should look like to, to meet the minimum requirements to run stuff inside of a container. Um, so how does it work? So digging in a little bit deeper. Uh, so process isolation. So one of the interesting, you know, side, you know, pieces of this is that performance is great because you're running it on the OS. So if you run this thing on the bare metal, you run a Docker container on the bare metal, it's as good as it gets. You know, it doesn't. The, literally the loss, we did some performance analysis, I saw some internal stuff. The only thing you lose a tiny little bit is like the network. You'll lose a little bit because it does some network address translation and whatnot. I think that the numbers I saw are about 5%. Mind you, not, no one's really done a lot of performance testing on this yet, but, but we're seeing near native speeds for almost everything, for the CPU, the RAM, the file system access. Um, you know, C groups then allow you to say, hey, I've got 10 what they call uh, you know, containers running on the system. I want to give each of them a tenth of the CPU, a tenth of the RAM, a tenth of the disk. You know, and, and I/O to the disk and all these other things. I/O to the memory, not just you know number of megabytes of memory or gigabytes of memory, but also I/O access to the memory because I have a memory bandwidth and I have a disk bandwidth. 
So C groups actually allows you to carve up each of those containers as if it's a real OS. So, so when you max out that container, he's running at full crank, you know, reading from the RAM as fast as he can. He'll only give up, get the percentage that you told him to get. So, and that that's a definite foundational piece. Um, and then, uh, you know, another interesting thing is it's LXC instead of KVM, so it's not. It's not a virtual machine, it's just a container. And then one that's actually on there that I didn't put is PAM uh, namespaces. So it allows us to virtualize temp. I don't know if you guys are familiar with the temp problem, but I mean, uh, the old Unix guys, I know we all know about this because it's a pain in the butt. But, but with PAM namespaces, when different users log into the same physical or virtual machine, they can't see each other's temp. So it's a virtualized temp space. So when you have all these containers running, they have full access to their own temp that looks like their own temp, and they can't see each other. In fact, even root can't see other people's temp. So, so there's ways with SE Linux and, and PAM namespaces to totally isolate processes from each other, which looks a lot better than containers did like even a, um, a year or two ago. So um, on the layered file system piece, um, Device Mapper, so Alex Larson, Red Hatter guy, he, he decided one day to play around kind of Linus Torvalds thing where, hey, I just got this idea, let me play around with Device Mapper, got it to work. I was like, cool, we can actually run this, this, this branching file system on RHEL and on Fedora without having to do too much with a different driver. Um, and there's a base image, and then there's layered, layered, layered commits, basically, two different images. So what you see coming down the road is you'll see like certified images coming out of Red Hat. That will be, here's a certified RHEL 7 image. And then you'll be able to build your own layers on that. So to build your core builds, instead of having like all this, I don't, I don't want to say I, I don't like Puppet. Actually, I was going to wear my Puppet shirt today. But, but you don't have to do that now. So if you have a layered file, so, you know, something that you lay over it, you can actually do diffs between the layers. So since it's a file system, you can actually do diffs between the layers. So it's pretty interesting. Again, a very different feature than virtual machines. You know, you log into a virtual machine, change some stuff, save it as a template and deploy from that thing. Like a year from now, nobody knows what's in that template. Everyone loses complete. They're like, I have no idea what was in that thing. And there was never, you know, the, the dream that I think VMware had of having uh, sort of a service-based, you just download this appliance, and you're like, oh, this is the base image for all these different OSs. I don't think that really ever came to fruition. But with, with these containers, I do think that's going to come to fruition because they're just regular RHEL running inside this container. And so there's 13,000 ISV apps that run on RHEL. And if we can push a lot of those guys to certify their stuff you know, on RHEL, then it works in Docker. So now you've got automatically certified pieces of software. And if you can get more and more people to deliver their software with these images, which I'll show you the dream state, which is the registry server, I keep coming back to the way Docker deploys the registry server. They've kind of given you what this thing should look like. And then uh, you can do commits to those base images. So that's the cool part. Again, build up your own customized versions of these images based off some known good state. And then the other cool thing is when you deploy from this, this layered file system, as opposed to doing something like Puppet and Satellite or Kickstarts or all these other things that we've done over time, deploying from templates and VMware, there's a million different ways, but all of those things require infrastructure to work. So Every time you go to build a system, you're, you're incurring risk because any one of those deter, you know, dependent on systems could be down and dead. So, so like if you go to kickstart a box and the satellite server is down, or the, or the kickstart box is, you know, whatever you want, your, your DHCP server is down, your boot P server is down, you can't, you can't actually create boxes. As you get to that cloud state where like Amazon, where they need to keep being able to deploy images because that's now a 24 by 7 critical piece of infrastructure, their deployment infrastructure. You know, you have to actually, you have all this complexity added to do that. When you do with Docker and you have base images, there's nothing. You just hit a button and another, another one spits out. As long as, that, as long as that base image resides in the local registry, there's no external dependencies. And so the only time you have those external dependencies is when you go to build those base images. So when you go to certify and build those base images, that's nice because now you're kind of asynchronous, you know. There's not a, there's not a synchronous dependent, you know, dependency on the, on the infrastructure or on the servers. So on the network side, uh, it's actually pretty simple. It's just a bridge and network address translation. So it's actually